Hello everyone and welcome back to yet another video and part 2 of the Whippet series. After having the lovely time building the kit last episode, now the next step is to paint it and that's what this video will be all about. In this episode we will be applying the first minor weathering and applying a heavy post shade camo onto the tank. Now as I disassemble the tank into its sub assemblies or really just take off the tracks for ease of painting and priming the model with Mr. Surfacer 1500 Black, I will just take some time and say that I am sorry for the lack of uploads. I know that summer has now came and went, but during the past three months I have barely had any time to sit down at my workbench and actually continue with this series and modelling as a whole. School, work and the holidays have really taken up my time, but now I am back and as ready as ever. As I'm recording this, I am working on several models all at once, which means that there should be plenty of videos which will be able to be uploaded soon. Now to conclude this little monologue, I just want to ask you to please join the Discord server that is this in the description. It's not mine, nor is it really related to just my work, but it's a great place to be and the community is genuine and nice, so please do consider joining. Now to get to the meat of this episode, the post shading. Now there's been a lot of debate on whether post or pre-shading is the better choice, and I've come to the conclusion that both are good and that is a senseless argument. However, for this model, due to it having a single tone camo, just like the T30 before, it will be pre-shaded. I do this because it adds a little more interest, and also it begins the pre-dusting, so that this model can very early on look really used and really put it into that World War One atmosphere. When most people think about that sort of time period, World War One and trench warfare, most people will straight away think of the dirt, the thick mud and the large amount of dust that's just been there. So this will actually be very helpful because it makes it a lot easier for the later weathering process. Now I say this because some of you might question the paint choice I have. This being XF51 khaki drab, XF49 khaki, as well as using deck tan or for Batamia. Now deck tan is that very light dust colour which will often be used for pre-dusting. However, these colours will form what I call the ultimate pre-dust. I know, very dramatic. And I can say it is very good, not just for this model, but for any other model. I I've enjoyed using it on the majority of little projects I've had. It's honestly a great combination of colours. Now, another debate I often see is the debate on what the correct colour of British World War One tanks is. You have many illustrations, such as the one that came with this main kit, that show the tank as being a dark green. However, the most often agreed upon conclusion is that these tanks were painted a brown. Now, this is where the colour choice comes in. Khaki drab may look green, however when it does dry up it becomes more of a sort of brownie green, something in between. Now this will be useful because I'll be adding a lot of mud down the line, and it'll be dark brown with a lot of the wet points, and it'll be heavy. So the point is, I don't want the main body colour to look like the mud, because that just doesn't really look good, at least to me. I'm more of a artistic person when it comes to this, I'm not going to be going down the realistic modeler's path, and I hope they don't come after me and crucify me because my model isn't historically accurate. Now to actually get on with the painting, I decided to model the paint in an almost cloudy pattern so that the layers underneath can still be seen. With the khaki drab as the first main base layer, I can make it so that there is already a start to the pin washes that will be added later on. The darker panel lines and recesses will be a lot easier to do because the wash won't need to be as strong since the undertone of the black primer is actually visible in those spaces. Also this tank will be either a pin washing dream or nightmare depending on how much you like the process. There are so many little rivets and details on this model that it's just absurd and pin washing could be a video on its own. Now that is a good idea if I ever get desperate for views. Now, the highlight layer has been about a 40% khaki mixed into the original layer with the khaki drab, but for some reason the camera really doesn't like to pick it up. On photos and in person it's clear as day, but on camera it's just not picked up as well, I'm not sure if it's the lighting or something else, but 
here you just have to believe me. It's there, you can see in person, but and you can see it at the end, but it, now it's just not very good. Again, I go over the cloudy pattern and the whole mottling process, and I spray at a low PSI. This means that there's a little bit of that overspray, which really works on this sort of tank and this camo scheme as a whole. Now, right after this, my favorite part of the painting process came in, where I get to use the ultimate pre-shade. Again, very dramatic, isn't it? I decided to use it in a way that would act both as the second highlight layer, but would also create the first dust streaks. It would act as a pre-dust layer, like this very early on, it's already working as intended. It creates the very first building blocks of the weathering that will be coming in the next episode. This means that a lot of the third layer will be visible later on and maximum contrast is necessary here. Now with the post shading out of the way, I need to paint the British insignia. These are very interesting on these First World War British tanks since they allow for some pop of colour. These will be painting using white with a vertical strip of red going down the centre, and these would get worn down very quick since to my understanding these were applied on the field, so they would have neither been perfect nor well kept. So before spraying the colour, I apply a pretty thick layer of chipping fluid to allow for the insignia to easily be worn down. To do this I apply between two to three layers, allowing for each previous layer to dry. Here I'm just using some simple Tamiya white with the little bit of the pre-dust that was left over in the airbrush so that the paint doesn't look too striking to the eye. Now to keep the overspray of the red to a minimum since the application process would have been with paint brushes rather than compressors on the front, I use a piece of card to mask it. I do this so that there is no overspray since that would look horrid due to red being a very distinct colour when it's sprayed on top of white. Wearing the insignia down I had to use a multitude of tools ranging from old airbrush needles to both soft and heavily worn brushes to not create a single consistent wear pattern. To not create a single consistent wear pattern but to make it a lot more unique and random in that sense. It really didn't matter, especially on this lower plate of what I later found out to be the fuel tank housing. The paint was very worn down since that area is protruding and I expect a lot of debris to hit it. Following this I did the same on both sides but the video was completely unusable due to my fat hands covering up the whole screen. Now with that done, I continue on to the decals. There weren't many of them, but they were a good addition nonetheless. As usual, I spray the surface where the decals will be going with a coat of gloss varnish so that the amount of silver ink is limited. Of course, there will still be some present, but at the end a coat of varnish should make it barely noticeable. Cutting out the decals is the next step on the list, and this yet again is done to minimise the amount of silver ink that the decals get in the end. I know some people who will do this task meticulously and cut out every single part that is transparent. They do this so that there is barely any silvering at all on the model. To me it really seemed like a waste of time because I really never bothered too much about it since it's not too hard to clean up in the end. The benefits of spending so long cutting them out is barely noticeable since you can just varnish them later and get the exact same results. To apply the decals onto the model, as per usual, I'll be using the VMS 2-in-1 decal set and softener. I know that it's not the most common choice, but it works for me, and that's all that matters. After soaking the decals in warm water and drying them out on a paper towel, I use a pair of tweezers to position the decals in the correct space, and then again apply a cut of VMS decal solution. With a Q-tip, I push the decals firmly into the place. The decals I used were the ones that came out of the box, however, I'm not replicating the vehicle that the decals represent. Now, whilst researching the Whippet, I came across this very image. It appears to be a Whippet that was used to move a lot of equipment, but the most interesting details are the painted on lines which attempt to break up the location of the viewports and conceal them in a rather unique way. 
Of course I couldn't pass this since I just love adding these little niche details to my models so that they are technically accurate in a way, but also different from other models. I just used a mixture of Vallejo dark grey and black to make a colour appropriate for the lines and apply them by hand. This form of applications allows for some imperfections and adds that worn feeling of the model. Finally, the last thing I'll be doing in this video is a little experiment. I've seen many people attempt to get a better rust effect on exhaust and other parts of tanks by using different glazes, like I had in my previous project. However, I wanted to see this on the tracks of the Whippet, because I want it to be as rusty as possible. So here I am applying several glazes of different greys and blues to hopefully make the rust that I'll be applying in the next episode turn out a little more interesting than the usual bland dark brown that's usual with enamel washes. The mixes I used were completely random, with the first one being a mix of white and dark grey with a large amount of Vallejo glaze medium added. These were not placed in any pre-planned position but were completely random, and if I decided that a spot could use some more, I mixed it wet over the top of the previous layers. The second colour mix was the first one, just slightly lighter with some more white. The third mix was where it began to be interesting, where I added some tan to create more contrast. I also want to see how the rusty enamels will work with a dusty pre-tongue to it. Finally, the most anticipated colour for me was the sky blue mix in with a very light grey. This is the single colour that I'm questioning whether it will turn out well or not, since it might be too striking and bleed through, causing the tracks to just look horrid. And with this last step out of the way, this week's work has finished. Now guys, I hope that this video was entertaining and that you like and subscribe if you want to see the next episode and any other future projects I'll be making. Overall, this has been an interesting model to make and I've been having fun with it, but as my desk is currently cluttered with five different models, it's not so easy to enjoy each one to its fullest. But that also means that more videos will be coming very shortly. And I hope within the next two weeks, the next and possibly last episode of the Whippet will be released. Again, I thank you for staying to the end and I hope you've liked this video. Have a great rest of the week and I hopefully will see you again soon.